There are a million ways to case or trim out a window. I don't know what kind of window you've got, but I'm going to show you the different parts, the different components, and what I call each individual piece on this prototype window that I just trimmed out in this house before I dive into the remaining 19 that have to be done also. So let me show you what I'm going to refer to as you watch me do window number two in just a few minutes that's out in the garage. Before I show you casing a window, let me give you some terms so you know what I'm talking about. And disclaimer, these are what I call these pieces, and it may not be what they're called in your area, but you're going to get the idea. First of all, the boards that run back to the sash, the sash is the window that's holding in the glass, so the boards that run back to the sash, perpendicular to the wall, are called the jam. On the jam, this is a leg, this is a head, this is a leg, and this is either the sill or the stool, depending on who you talk to. The case is the material that covers the crack between the jam and the drywall. The case lays flat against the wall. This is a case leg. This is a case leg. This is the case at the head. I usually just call it the head. And this is the apron. That's it. Jams, case. Let's go put one together. This is the window that I'm going to demonstrate this on. And step one in casing a window is building the jam. This jam assembly is going to be built on the floor and set in place. And once I've done that, I'll back up and show you the dimensions that were critical in order to make the thing fit once it goes in the hole. I have enough of a production mentality that I like to gang cut. And even when it gets right down to two legs the same length, I just as soon cut them at once. Even if I have to cut twice, I would like to make the final cut simultaneously. So I've got the mark on the top, I flush one end, I bring it over, and this way at least I know that if the cut's not quite right, at least both sides of the opening are going to have the same distance. So the elephant in the living room is that with the design and the budget that we have on our house, we're using a very nice pre-primed pine finish material instead of a stain grade molding or a fiberboard like an MDF extruded molding or something. Now, if this woodwork that we're casing these windows out with was going to be stained instead of painted, the process would be much, much slower and the material would be much, much, much more expensive. So this beautiful material right here from Matri is exactly the right product for our project. Now, not so much anymore, but when I was younger, it was always a temptation for me to just jump right into a project like this. You know, just grab a board, make a cut, and start nailing. But I've learned it's always a good idea to take a deep breath and sort of you know, look over the whole situation, if you can, before letting out the clutch. Check a few dimensions. Make sure the folks that installed the window got it square and that it's setting plumb. Just make sure that you reduce the number of ambushes that you're going to have to fight through before you get clear through to the other side. This little jam assembly dropped right in. When I say dropped right in, I mean it went into the hole. There's still slack. The front edge of the jam is in a plane with the edges of the wall. That's really important. And there is room to adjust the reveal. The reveal is the dis in this case, the reveal is the distance from the edge of the vinyl to the face of the jam. To get that distance, you saw me measuring. I took this distance and then added two times what I wanted the reveal to be. So whatever the reveal is that you want, if you want it little bitty or all the way back, you double that, cut your piece, and then you know that you will be able to have an even reveal top and bottom and side to side if you do your math right. So now I'm going to anchor this. I'm going to put it in with nails. I'm going to hold it in a position 
where it belongs with a combination of shims and nails. The reveal that I'm using, that is from the face of the plastic to the face of the jam is 5 16ths of an inch. 5 16ths is about eight millimeters. And so I'm going to carefully gauge and fasten this jam all the way around, keeping the distance from the vinyl to the face of the board as close to that magic 5 16ths of an inch as I can. But here's the key. In this case, if it looks good, it is good. A shim is an application of an inclined plane. And it's an ancient, ancient tool. I would say that shims have probably been around just about as long as a string line, and they are just about as useful. Now factory made shims come in a variety of wood species depending on their size and their intended uses, but door shims like these are usually softwood and fairly brittle because a big part of setting doors and windows is being able to easily break them off for different reasons and at different times. Now the thing about shims is that they can apply an amazing amount of force in a perfectly controllable way. And then they will hold that load perfectly still for as long as you need it to be held. The casing is not complicated, but it can be messed up. And the easiest way to mess up casing is by not getting, here's that word again, the reveal right. The reveal that I'm using between the edge of the casing and the inside of the jam is 3 16ths of an inch. Now I'm not going to measure that because even though it has to be perfect, it only has to look perfect. And so if it looks perfect to you when you're putting it in, it's going to look perfect to everyone else that ever walks by. But here's what you've got to watch. Whatever the reveal is on the side, the length of your piece is going to dictate that reveal at the top. So before you shoot it, you need to look to make sure that the distance between the end of the board and the bottom of this jam head is going to be the same reveal as between the edge of the board and the edge of this jam. So you make sure that that is virtually the same and then proceed with caution. Let's talk about nail length. I'm using a two and a half inch, 15 gauge, electroplated galvanized nail. I've got to get through three quarters of an inch of trim, half an inch of drywall, that's an inch and a quarter. That leaves me a full inch and a quarter of embedment into the king stud and the trimmer, which are the two framing members you remember back behind here. I can get some really good connections. I'm not gonna to try to run a two and a half inch nail through the edge of that board into the edge of this one. I'm gonna shorten it up so that it doesn't hit a knot or a piece of crooked grain and dive out and make another hole for the painter to fix. Now I'm guessing that you've noticed that these boards are not just different widths, but also different thicknesses. This is pretty common in craftsman design. You know, anything of the craftsman era is liable to have different thicknesses of molding. And it adds a simple, clean sort of visual interest without really rising to the level of being an ornament. But as I watch these things being nailed up, I realize that I just have to stop putting off, putting a hook on my finish nailer. I've got to be able to hang it on my belt, and I should have done it the first week I owned it. And speaking of finish nailers, not only do they save time with the speed of driving the nail in, but they countersink the nails perfectly. And so a carpenter almost never has to stop, pull out his hammer, dig out the right size nail set, to drive down a protruding nail head for the painter. The danger is that it is so easy to put in too many nails. And so the time saved by the carpenter is eaten up by the time wasted by the painter. All right, now's the time to sort of roll the dice and hope that I don't send a shiner out into the finish area as I'm nailing the, the case legs to the jam legs. Now just a comment about why we are not sealing the space between the finished jams and the rough jams, that narrow space doesn't amount to anything. And it's already been sealed up on the inside with expanding foam. It's sealed up very well on the outside with the trim, the building wrap, and the flange on the window. And then the trim is going to be 100% caulked into place on the inside again. So it would have been a giant waste of time. So there, there was another alternative for the moldings in here, right? And that was 
MDF, medium density fiberboard. You've probably seen that. It comes in all sorts of profiles and it looks about like this, but it's not like this. Because these boards, I put them up, I nail them, there's a nice crisp hole to fill and sand and cover. But with MDF, you put it up and you nail it and a little volcano pimples up there that has to be sanded off or scraped off and reprimed and dapped and you can always find it. And then over time, you look and after a while, yep, you can tell it was MDF and it'll save you some money and it looks good when you put it up. But I can tell you what, there's just something about putting up a piece of wood molding that makes me feel like a carpenter and I'm just glad to be able to do it. I've got 18 more of these windows to put in. There are five or six of them that are the same sizes, so that helps, right? But there's enough of them that I've called in some help. My friend Dave Luger, who watches the channel and helps me in some other areas, said, hey, I'll come help you with those windows. And I said, deal. So you're gonna get a look at him, he's very meticulous, which is one of the characteristics for finish work, right? For a finished carpenter, you gotta be able to slow down, tighten up your dimensions, and make it nice. Even if it's paint grade, it needs to be nice. Now, if this appeals to you and you would like to learn a lot of really, really pro tricks about Finnish carpentry, I want to recommend Richard at Finnish Carpentry TV. He's got a great channel. He knows a lot. I'm going to say he knows all, but let's just back up and say he knows a lot of the tricks about doing Finnish carpentry. And I would like to learn some of them from him, so perhaps you would too. So I cut out all of the material packages for all of the windows scattered it throughout the house, and my friend Dave Luger just went to town. I like to do things this way because I've learned that modern construction should be thought of as the in-place mass production of one-of-a-kind items. So what that means is, any time that I get a chance, I like to break the work down into individual tasks. I like to reduce the risk elements I like to try to stage the work efficiently. I establish my quickest but sustainable pace, and I always remember the trades that are going to be following me. This last window was the Tuffy. It was high up over the front door, and the only way I could get to it was off of a ladder. So I changed the process up a little bit. I got all the measurements. I added a little distance so the reveals around the window were a little wider and more forgiving. And then I nailed the whole thing together on the ground. Now as a kid, I always loved to climb trees and build tree houses. So I think that I sort of like working in less than ideal conditions like these sometimes. By the way, those three screws that are stuck in the middle of these jams are so I could get a hold of the jams and hold it back if I needed to just before I was going to nail them in place. Yep, no question about it. I've got to make a hook for this nail gun. So installing all this woodwork on these windows is really only about 60% of the fight. We're going to leave it to the painters to take these things across the finish line. They're excellent at their craft. And there is a lot of truth to the fact, to the cliche and worn out phrase that, you know, a little putty and a little paint makes a builder what he ain't. These things are gonna shine like the fender of a brand new Ford pickup when these guys are done with them. And they will always have a good start on looking good for the people that live in this house. And speaking to the point of living in this house, you may or may not know that we have a whole series. We have everything that happened before we got to this point, and we're gonna have everything that happens after. So if you're interested in casing windows, you might be interested in pouring concrete. I recommend that you check out our series. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.